Hello, this is Chris Kobe with the League of Women Voters of Portland. You are watching the Video Voters Guide. In conjunction with Metro East Community Media, we are here to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Albert Lee, running for the U.S. House of Representatives in Oregon's 3rd District, which covers most of Portland and Multnomah counties and the northeastern part of Clackamas County. Welcome, Albert, and please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for Congress. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the uh, introduction. My name is Albert Lee. I'm running to represent the people of the 3rd District of Oregon uh, to Congress. I am running because I believe, first of all, that democracy requires choice. It's something that we haven't had here in over a generation. We face a series of crises here in this district, across the country, and around the world that require bold action now, and not just inspirational and aspirational words. Next, I believe in the basic tenets of the Democratic Party when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think it's time that we uplift some new voices from some other backgrounds, from some other lived experiences to represent us here in the most diverse district of the state. And lastly, I'm running because I believe that it's time that we end this oligarchy, this rule by elite career multimillionaire politicians, and replace them with citizen representatives who know the struggle, who won't take co cor corporate contributions, and who will truly represent and fight for the people. Now, quickly, a little bit about myself. I'm a sixth generation American and an immigrant at the same time. I was born in South Korea, where my African American army dad met my Korean mom during the Vietnam War. I grew up in working class St. Louis first-generation college grad, first-generation law school grad, served in the Army, and have done a, a lot of different things, including international trade, project management, and most recently was one of the deans at Portland Community College. How can Congress best address the current pandemic and its economic consequences? Yes, I mean, right now, uh, what Congress can do is help, uh, help support the people. We need a bailout for the people. Uh, what I've seen Congress do uh, with its powers has been atrocious. Uh, we first started off with trillions of dollars injected into Wall Street to protect the assets of the 1%. Uh, then we had to take days to deliberate on what we were going to do for the people. And ultimately, what came out of, it, out of it was $1,200 at some point in May for some small subset of the population and not all of the folks. Meanwhile, another half trillion dollars was uh, brought in for corporations with no strings attached. We need to right that ship. We need to actually put the money where it's needed, and that is in the people. So for, for what we need right now is we need an economic, emergency economic support of at least $2,000 per adult, plus $500 per child until this crisis is over. And I would say at least six months after the crisis is over. Albert, the current pandemic has also exposed problems with America's healthcare system. Hospitals are struggling and they're losing money. Some patients are facing bills they can't pay. Do you think our healthcare system needs to be changed? And if so, what changes would you suggest to it? Absolutely. So that's one of the main reasons why we're running, why I'm running. I'm running on a single payer Medicare for all system, because quite frankly, this crisis, this COVID crisis is showing all of the flaws of our current uh, for-profit employer-based private health insurance regime. Uh, right now with people, millions of people losing their jobs, they're not only losing their jobs, they're losing uh, their health insurance, uh, they're losing their ability to take care of themselves, and with a crisis of this nature, we need to make sure that we take care of tending to all of the sick in order to uh, really address this crisis, because without uh, really universal care, uh, we're not going to really uh, be able to end this crisis. Uh, it will continue to fester so long as there's people out there that are sick. So yes, I mean, what I'm looking at is a universal healthcare system like most of the major uh, industrial nations of the world have. Uh, we look at places like South Korea where uh, they have had a universal healthcare system uh, and a government that has coordinated its efforts and they've been able to flatten the curve tremendously regardless of how close they are to China. Um, we need to do the same thing. In contrast here, we've got a regime of private health insurance uh, that uh, is just not working. We do not have the personal protective equipment for the for the uh, first frontline uh, um, uh, workers. Uh, we have states and hospitals out bidding over each other to try to secure those uh, those much needed equipment. Something's got to give. We need to have a a system that's going to work for all of the country and one that's going to uh, to really take and move uh, the uh, equipment and the personnel to where it's needed places like New York at this time. Now, I know that our governor sent over uh, 
respirators and machines over to New York because the need is greater there than it is here. We need a system that's going to take care of, uh, of where, the, where the pain points are. Okay, turning to a more traditional issue, how should Congress most effectively perform its oversight responsibilities of the executive branch of the national government? You know, it's funny you say that because we've watched over the last 40 years as the executive branch has uh, taken the balance of power. Uh, you know, a lot of it has been at the acquiescence of Congress. Everything from the war powers uh, 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 abilities of Congress, they've shifted over to the, to the president. The other thing is, uh, you know, we have allowed the president to uh, take and, uh, and knock down oversight. We have uh, inspectors generals uh, who look at waste, fraud, and abuse within our systems. We have ombudsmen, ob I'm sorry, really <laughs> funky word right there, Scandinavian word, uh, that are supposed to take a look and, and do the oversight. Uh, but overall, over all of those things is uh, our, our Congress. Our Congress is supposed to be taking a look. Uh, it has got the power of the purse, and it also has uh, the power uh, to, to do these oversights. And what we see is because of the money in politics, uh, we see a lack of oversight, but we see a lot of uh, more high uh, pro, uh, bi, uh, bipolar, um, not, not bipolar, but polarity between the two sides uh, who are focused on just maintaining their power instead of doing the work of the people. Uh, in order to get rid of all of that, what you really need to do is to take a look at the money in politics. Uh, we have 40 years of Supreme Court uh, decisions from Buckley v. Vallejo all the way up to Citizens United that have currently, that continue to allow more and more money in politics, more and more voice to those uh, special invested interests instead of the will of the people. We need to curtail that. We need this and, uh, and overturn Citizens United. We need to have publicly financed campaigns. These things are going to help get regular citizen voices back into Congress, those that are gonna really truly work for and fight for the people and make sure uh, that we have the oversights necessary uh, over the executive branch as well as the rest of the government. Robert, if you wanna try a quick last question, do you favor or oppose the abolition of the Electoral College and why? Yes, so you know, the Electoral College was built uh, and designed at a, at a different time. Uh, back then, we didn't even have a popular vote of the president. Uh, and the Electoral College was sort of uh, an answer or uh, between having a popular vote that wasn't truly popular and having Congress uh, install a president. Uh, 200 years, 200, over 200 years later, we're looking at a different scenario now. Uh, we have the emancipation uh, and, and, and we have uh, the ability of all citizens to vote. Uh, we have direct elections. And I think that it is time that we end uh, the Electoral College because uh, the function or, or the system that it was set up in was from a different time and it was for a different place and it doesn't really function the way it should. Um, you know, I think that really we should have a national popular vote. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Appreciate yes. your views. Uh, this has been the Video Voters Guide. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and the ballot measures and exercise your right to vote. Thank you for watching.